I had been watching videos from another channel called Nick Beardia, starting with his Guardsman series. He's done some great content as well as a series about Fallout on his videos. I don't remember the name, but it's the one where the Enclave officer took over the wasteland. The guy who wrote that was a dick, I later found out. But you know, that's life. In that trilogy of videos, Nickberia had linked to a Discord server called the Capital Wasteland. The server's pretty much dead now, as most of the activity was from the bloated mod team, of which I was and now a part of again. The game plan. Being a part of a beta release of the D&D server, I had seen a fair amount of meme characters being built and run. To be fair, the server was born from a meme YouTube channel. No surprises there. I had collected four people on the server. Axe, Blue, Simple and I. Simple was a cunt and basically dropped out mid-campaign. We had set goals to character building. One, be a living meme. We were to all run as people with edgy backstories. Two, we had to be ironic communists and speak with a Russian accent. And three, all blight. As for what the party would do, it was decided that we would raise as much hell as possible. We were to collect ourselves and push into a vault, which then needed a base beforehand to allow us to build robots to aid us in storming the vault. From there, we would build out and restore the vault as an ironic communist utopia, essentially a corporatist individualist society, and slowly amass weapons of mass destruction through dismantling nuclear vehicles. We would start with firebombing the breadbasket of the wastes, the Republic of Dave, somehow pinning it on the Brotherhood or some other institution. We wanted to cause chaos. Next, we wanted to bomb Project Purity with a nuclear warhead mortar. And somewhere in between that, build a fucking Killdozer Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, and storm the goddamn cunts at the Citadel. At the least, we were an ambitious party. To draw out the length of this, I'll only go over Ivan's backstory the events of the campaign, the Vegas fiasco, and the still ongoing game I'm doing on my server. Axe and Blue have basically fucked off to college, and I've been the only one to survive from the original campaign in the Capital server. Description. Ivan is a very tall, broad-shouldered man, stood at 6'7", weighing in at 280 pounds. He was a terrifying Russian wall of might and make. Etched into his physique was a sturdy, iron-willed man, his steady blue eyes blended into the skyline. His hairline receded, receiving shaved forehead and a scar from temple to chin. His blocky jawline could set square mason work, and his skin blended easily into the snow of his home. The mesomorph of a man armoured his skin in thick leathery hide, becoming a hardened callous mass that could grind steel. He was lined from neck to toe in thick brown body hair, naturally curling in random directions. Breaking the thick fur he grew were long scars from his bullets, burns and blades. Under his chin, should one be lucky enough to comb through his beard, would read Mirtwitz. Prologue. Born into slavery, Ivan knew little about the outside world from his camp. He was brought into the world amidst a struggling blizzard, sweeping away the old decrepit buildings that his mother and grandmother took refuge in. Warmed by a campfire and a blanket, the newborn took after his father, Anton. His childhood was short, growing to nine before his only remaining family had died. His poor grandmother had passed away in her sleep, Ivan being the one to discover her remains. With help, he buried her outside of her home, under the largest pine tree in the yard. Too young to work, his father collected Ivan to live with him. Shortly after the boy grew used to a bomb collar leashed to his neck, conditioned to see the world through his father's views of conformity and safety. Ivan was groomed to be a mechanic and hunter by Anton, years of brutal punishment for error and gripping. He was wrought day and night on his teaching. In time, his father had turned on Ivan, becoming more abusive, neglectful and callous. Anton worked slaves day and night, working his son along with them. Bullets, whips and bombs, Anton terrorised his crew as much as he did his slaves. Months passed the years under Anton's iron grip. The slaves watched closely. The guards were watched closer. Error in form or speech was cracked down on like treason. Ivan taking to conformity for 14 years before being called to extinguish his first human life. Hunting was normal for Ivan. He knew to kill, process and serve food from field to fire. His gaze on the ex-guard had implanted into Ivan's mind. The fear of the guard, 
His quiet sobs went on for minutes as Anton watched Ivan stare this man down. The guard was to die, and Ivan would join too if he refused. In desperate desire to gain his father's approval, he had followed his father's command. He would never forget the sight of the guard sprawled out along the snow-caped ground, residual body heat radiating from the mass of flesh he had shot. He saw the dead man left for the animals to eat. A quiet and serene place to die. The trees had stood like walls, heavily rooting into the ground around him in a quiet wood. He remembered it was because Anton refused to speak to Ivan, torturing his son for murdering another man for years, mentally tormenting and warping this child into a monster. Another two years passed quietly, in the snow and cold. Ivan had been on watch, questioning his life choices as he saw someone leave the gate. Anton had in hand a backpack, pistol and a leather coat. Anton had left camp, which wasn't abnormal for him to do, periodically leaving to do something like piss in the woods or going out to see the lake. But instead of getting too cold and returning, Anton had remained out for hours. The guards and slaves had been fed up with their similar treatment and had organised a coup against Anton. Looking for his son, they grabbed him at gunpoint and started defusing the slave collars. Upon agreement, Ivan joined them, as they knew Anton's son wasn't better off than they were. Hours turned into days, days turned into weeks. Anton left, and the newly freed slaves and guards had slowly started to transition into a small settlement in the snow of the north. Ivan, still disillusioned with the thoughts of his father's affection, and watched the wilds for any signs of return. Anxious, Ivan had started out in search for his father, following his father's steps in the snow. Months of trudging, tracking and gruelling travel led him to foreign lands further than he had been conditioned to know. The blackest fears had wrung Ivan's mind, terrorising him worse than any punishment that Anton could wind up. Armed with his hunting rifle, the boy was to walk alone for many days, the force providing him with food and nourishment upon him reaping it from the ground. He had stumbled on a remnant of his land, an old base still defended by men in green camel. Their weapons were large and foreign to him. Walking to them, he had come to contact with a woman who he had come to hate as much as he would hate his father in adulthood. As cold as ice, she made a stride with confident and deadly walk. Her heels impacted the hard ground audibly before the young man of 16. Her face was ripped and maimed from a large scar. Her feminine beauty ripped asunder by some long forgotten conflict. They had come eye to eye as her men had radioed in about some disturbance. Some stroke of luck had written Ivan's fate to survive the last woman he had wanted to meet. She'd kill men for less than ogling her, though to call her prudent would be a lie. She knew her sins, bearing them for the world to see in professional military attire. Her button-up blouse fluttered brilliantly with the square shoulders, brass decorating the razor-sharp ends. Her blonde hair had struck up in the wind, whipping around. She came closer to the young Ivan, intrigued about the armed young man before her. She had introduced herself as Balalaika, and in a rare facade had offered to shake the boy's hand. Cautiously he did so, ready in mind to fight should she want something of his. Instead, she had offered to walk with the boy, sending her escorts away. It was rare to see strangers this far out in uncivilised lands, as she had explained to Ivan the backwater they were both in using the thick forest around them as the example. She had looked and saw nothing but his home, something that gave him life and prosperity. Even being far from home, he knew how to travel the woods. He knew to kill and to create, to repair, to maintain and even improve. He had explained to her that this land was far from backwater. It teemed with life and vibrantly teemed with creatures and the green in the summer months. She had looked at the dead winter screen of cold and white death that had frozen the land around them. Without the warmth of the summer months, food was hard to find, she explained. Maybe Ivan was right about the summer, but the winter had driven off or killed the foolish to walk the land alone. Ivan couldn't refute the logic. He looked at her and questioned her motive to speaking to a young man. With a sigh and carefully planted eye from her, she explained that she was always looking for more young men to join the Russian mob. Ivan pulled back at the thought of joining someone else. All he had known from strangers was grueling service work. Balalaika saw Ivan recoil at the offer, almost being offended. She retracted her statement before asking about the matter with the young boy. He couldn't truly know the meaning of something bigger than himself. Ivan looked around himself, 
Drawing back into nature, the picture they both saw in the world had finally defined a line between them. He had looked fondly on these woods with rose glasses, knowing its land and people. She looked at them with contempt, looking at their worst parts as if it were their only feature. He explained to her that the woods here had more to offer than strife and death. She moved in closer, looking the young man up and down. She offered her hand out once again, but instead she offered payment in exchange for service on request. Ivan backed up again. However, he had listened to her proposal of work. She offered to pay him in supplies and equipment for knowledge of the land. Concerned, low in morale and tired, Ivan hesitantly agreed, shaking her cold hand. She warmed her arms after finalising the deal. She smiled, probably the first warm thing Ivan had seen in the time he had followed his father. Weeks passed before he had finished a detailed regional map of his knowledge, labelling the outpost he had originated from, detailing the defences and the manned walls, as well as local knowledge about the land around the outpost, detailing hunting spots, game knowledge, forage spots and trading villages. For his work he would be rewarded with food, a snow bike and ammunition for his rifle. A month had passed before he had turned his back to the temporary home he had taken refuge in. Balalaika had watched him leave from her tower, amidst the top of the compound they held. She watched the young Russian man travel off before readying her forces to capture the long evading wilds of the deep Russian wilderness. The land came to an end before the young man had. The ocean had washed up on the cold snowbound land, lead this way by the news of a hated man. Anton was a travelling disaster by all accounts. Ivan walking through destroyed village after destroyed village. His father's wanton destruction, driving grief and loathing despair for the interlope. Hundreds of first-hand stories of a man with Anton's description, able to slip in and out of the shadows like a spirit, able to jump the most vigilant of Nightwatch, his cruelty with flame and blade becoming legendary. Ivan pressed onward, following the trail of destroyed homes and distraught men and women. He had come to a fishing village with a working ferry. It was strange to Ivan as this was the last place he had heard of Anton's lunacy had ended. Without death or destruction, the village had still life-bearing people, walking about their small homes. They lived their lives peacefully. He had watched in bewilderment to the lack of discipline the small children had. They did not know true work or hardship, but their laughter, screams to play and fun. He watched closely as they ran around one another. A strange, hollow feeling had overcome the boy. His eyes saw just children playing, but he thought of the things he had experienced. The death, the flame, Anton. He felt sickened after seeing the children and walked away to a spot he had seen in the tree line. For the first night in a week, he couldn't sleep, not due to cold or hunger, but of his father. He questioned so many things he had done. He questioned his love of his father, his longing to reunite. He questioned the doubts in his mind. Maybe Anton wasn't a monster. Maybe he was just being framed. The blackened thoughts of a loveless son had kept the young boy awake for hours before the night had taken him into sleep. He had awoken up to screams and the sound of explosions. Getting ready, Ivan quickly started making his way towards the village. Large smoke sacks rose from the homes along the dimly lit beach. He saw his father along the docks, smashing brightly lit Molotov cocktails at the entrance, warding off any pursuit Anton quickly got into a speedboat, tethered to the dock and sped off. Vaguely familiar men in the green camo came running after his father, firing fully automatic rifles at his speedboat. The speeding boat avoided the gunfire easily, leaving Ivan grounded. He now had to track Anton across the sea, panicking. Ivan took off after him on foot, towards the dock, hopping onto the sea to get to a boat in time. Speeding off, Ivan had to see his father. He had to ask all the questions that burned in his mind. Minutes slid into hours as Ivan's boat slowly creeped up on Anton's. Their boats separated by a quarter mile of open ocean. Their boats chased each other across the ocean for days. The nights had been rough as Ivan wearily kept on his father's trail. The occasional pop from the nuclear motor had told Ivan of an issue with the pistons. His craft started to power down, much to the growing frustration of the young man. A final explosion had been the end of the motor. Infuriated, that damned man will answer for Ivan's questions. In the middle of the pitch black night, the boy felt around as he repaired the motor. It was a simple machine that had been run too hard for too long. Several hours passed 
and in stubborn defiance, Ivan had repaired his new boat. However, he had no trace of Anton, no leads in where he is going. Ivan had decided to move eastwards. Following old maps, he was to arrive in Anchorage after a few days of travel. Perhaps he could find something there. Months had passed as Ivan found menial work in Anchorage, passing the time as an assistant mechanist. Ivan scanned reports and passed his eyes for any signs of Anton. A further year had passed without anything as so much as a hint to the young man. His big break came in the form of a destroyed village to the south. In the time he had worked as an assistant, Ivan had accumulated a small wealth of caps to purchase another snowbike and some marginally better gear. Further south he had gone to investigate the possibility of Anton, the possibility of finding answers to his aching questions. As the young man prepared to leave, he saw the man who employed him for the last time. They shook each other's hands and departed. This trail of destroyed villages had continued on from Alaska to Canada, Ivan only being able to catch glimpses of the momentary eye-to-eye -eye encounters. All the while, Anton always one step ahead of poor Ivan, always slipping away at the last second from his son. The death and destruction that Anton raised slowly changed Ivan. While unable to continue his spree wantingly, Anton was still a destructive force for untold evils. Manslaughter, murder, rape, all of it was possible if it was from Anton. Ivan slowly started to assure the death of his father. He had come to a still burning village, having pulled into the brush with his hunting rifle. Overlooking the small huts in the snow, Ivan watched closely. He saw Anton for the first time in six months, following his 18th birthday. In hot pursuit were men in green camo. His father was pinned down, out of molotovs and ammo for his reserve pistol. To be deprived of killing his father was unacceptable to Ivan. With a brutal and clean efficiency, Ivan turned his gun on the men he had helped, pinning them down outside of the village. Before he could react, he saw that Anton had left the firefight, unable to find Anton. Ivan cursed quietly under his breath before being discovered. The last thing he remembered was glaring down at the end of a pistol of one of the many green men toted, surrendering. Ivan was brought 50 miles back from the village to a warehouse in Anchorage. This time, he was chained and beaten savagely, masked and gagged. He had heard the sounds of a quiet woman of familiar tone speak to him again. He had greeted the stranger, welcoming him to his death. Ivan hung his head, remembering Balalaika's voice. He spoke of the wilderness and its splendid wonder again, reminding her of its beauty. He felt the cold embrace of a weapon bash in his head. He had felt the pain radiate into confusion for a moment, before being blinded from a sudden bright white light. He saw the ceiling timbers above him, as well as the undercovered insulation from the roof. Balalaika looked at him quietly, sighing. She remarked at Ivan's presence, then turned and asked for the cutlery. Since Balalaika owed Ivan a favour for the map work he had done, she wasn't going to kill him. However, he was to become a marked man, never to return to the north for killing her men. Several hours passed as she used hot tools to scald the word dead man under his chin. Oh, that's what it means under his baby. Mm. Okay. Drugged and ditched outside of town with his shit thrown with him, he left again to track his father, who'd now gotten a long ways ahead of Ivan. It would be another several years of travel to the south, into the States. This is where Ivan would lose Anton again. However, Anton started becoming more calculating in his mass murder ducking into cities and highly populated zones across Northern California after two close calls in Idaho and Oregon. This is where he had met Alexei, an ex-NRC politician of middle age, still able to walk and move, but the fight had been taken out of him years ago. Now he follows philosophy of the old world. He was a fine gentleman. He took a liking to Ivan as he had been passing through Redding, California. Alexei was there on a personal trip to inquire about a fully intact pre-war library. Coincidentally meeting Ivan as he had sat in the same seat as Alexei had been in for some time. Convinced about Ivan's half-assed, nomadic lifestyle, Alexei wanted to join the Russian. Ivan's knowledge of English was limited, being warmed by the friendly demeanour of Alexei, who'd offered to help Ivan with the material. Pairing up, Ivan would shortly indirectly reveal why he was a nomad. Drawing his weapon on Anton in the middle of a densely packed venue at a Northern Californian winery, Alexei managed to talk some sense into Ivan before publicly pasting his father's brains across the pavement. Instead, Alexei had Anton imprisoned with his connections to the NRC government. 
It would be the next day that both of them would realise Anton was a good lockpick and had murder fucked his own escape from the cell. Aggravated at the loss, Ivan and Alexei continued tracking Anton. He continued south still, heading through the divide, narrowly making it through. Ivan and Alexei had met their third party member. Alone and defending himself from rad scorpions, Dmitri was on the verge of death. Ivan had brought his rifle to bear on the creatures, as well as Alexei using his submachine gun to help distract the bugs. They crumbled under the lead and hell as the young man looked into Ivan. Looking down on Dmitri, Ivan offered to help him up and to safety. Graciously accepting, Dmitri took Ivan's help and joined the party. Dmitri and Ivan becoming fast friends amidst the chaotic world. Dmitri looking up to the tall, smart Ivan, eager to impress someone. Dmitri had become fast in the medicine and gunplay. He could heal almost any wound, as well as shoot any target. Like brothers, Ivan and Dmitri bonded over the shared thought of humans and machinery. Likening the two to one another, Alexei completing the trio with the matters of the heart and mind, Ivan fixing the joints and augmenting the body, Dmitri mending the muscle and healing the wounds. The trio had arrived in Vegas after an additional month of chasing Anton. Foiling several plots from the madman, they had come to the precipice of something strange. While Alexei and Dmitri had been alone in Vegas, Ivan was brought before a fateful meeting of two men. They wore grey uniforms and black caps. They had been watching Ivan for some time now, calling themselves the Enclave. They had offered Ivan work as a man tracker in exchange for information on Anton. Ivan was unsure of these men. All organised factions pissed off the Man of the North, no matter their origin. Once again he would hesitate as he agreed to work with the faction. He had been a part of their game for two months tracking down an important asset to the Enclave through Nevada, ending with the destruction of a warehouse and many dead gang members. With their mission complete, the men in grey had given a detailed dossier on Anton and his current place of residence in the capital wasteland. So look guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed it. I love Fallout. It has to be one of my favourite science fiction settings ever. You know, um, who the fuck doesn't enjoy Fallout? It's just, it's so good. I, I love the whole Americana sort of feel, you know, it's really cool. It's one of my, like, you know, all-time favourites. So whenever I get to do a video lead to it, it's like, yes! Fuck yeah, you know what I mean? But uh, I got this sent in by the author. Uh, hopefully he likes more of it. I really hope so. Um, I did help get a lot of people in the door for the Discord that it was all a part of, so we'll just see with time. Hopefully this is not just a one-off, I really hope so. But look boys, as always, remember to subscribe, comment, like, all that other good stuff, and I'll see you in the next video.